Welcome to episode one of the MoGrit podcast. Here's what's in the huddle. He understood what discipline meant, and, and he learned that in the Marines uh, in World War II. As you know, he was on Saipan. Um, he won the, the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart, and uh, never talked much about it, but I think he understood that at some point in our lives, athletically or not, discipline becomes a foundation for the person that you would like to become. And if you don't have it, you're gonna struggle. He had a saying, when things go bad, get up and go back to work. My season didn't really end the last game of the year. I took a month off, but then I worked as hard or harder in the off season. You're listening to Mo Grit, which is all under the hood of Mo Motion Basketball, performance, training, and excellence. Here's the very first podcast interview that I had with my cousin Pete Holohan, who in high school was recruited by major schools to play basketball and football. Pete ended up playing football at Notre Dame and in the NFL for 12 years. As a nine-year-old, I witnessed the pride Pete brought to our family when we huddled around the television to watch him play in the Cotton Bowl. From the nosebleed seats in the away stadiums to the floor of our living room, I watched Pete in awe for several years while he played in the NFL. Even though I was a girl, I told myself that I had to find a way to be just like Pete. I always say that Title IX opened the road. My father gave me my first basketball and told me to get out there and win. The crazy intense kids in our mostly Irish neighborhood made me earn everything. And after I decided early in my life to pursue my passion, no matter the cost, and whenever there was a time of doubt, I looked up and was lucky enough to see my cousin Pete carrying the torch. Before I was even close to sure what I was going to do with this podcast idea, I went to Pete first. I asked him questions about choosing between hoops and football, about playing in bowl games for Notre Dame, about being recruited by Jim Boeheim, and backing up the great Kellen Winslow. We talked about pressure, overtraining, cortisone injections, concussions, meditation, and how much grit it took to achieve excellence. Here's a recording of our conversation in his home in San Diego in March 2015. If you want the transcript or notes or to read my first blog about how and why we ended up here, go to momotion.com. It's now time for the first Mo Grit podcast. Okay, we're here with Pete Holohan, my cousin, second cousin, I think once removed. I'm not sure how that works, but welcome to the show, Pete. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you. We're on Momotion Radio. We have, at this point, no listeners, but as soon as the family finds out, I think we'll collect a few. And it'll be fun for them to hear about your career. We followed you for years, and we would watch you play at Notre Dame or for the four NFL teams you played for and have limited time with you. And you were out in California, so we didn't see you as much. But I wanted to go back, because the last time I was with you was probably when I was writing my books and I was on book tour and we right. just stayed up one night and I had always been in awe of you and inspired by you and we just talked about what it meant to be a college athlete and a pro athlete and I wish I had a recorder so that's what we're here to do today and I wanted to go back because of the kids I work with and the parents of the kids uh, let's go over you know you as an as a young athlete like describe where you were in fifth and sixth grade and when did you know that you really wanted to be an athlete and you were different than others well, that's a good question. I think in terms of when I knew, it, it really, w initially it was about enjoying the game, having fun with the game, where really you would go out and y it wasn't about um, being the best or, or it was just about having fun. So around middle school, seventh, eighth grade, you know, I remember I made the, uh, the middle school team and I realized that I was a little bit better than the eighth graders and I was in, in, in seventh grade. Um, so that was really the first time that I noticed that I might be uh, a little bit better than than the other kids. So your priority as a kid, like most kids, is you wanted to be with your friends and you wanted to have fun. Mm -hmm. And then you realized you just looked around at 13 or 14 right. and realized that in order to get better, you sort of had to change that or you were just gravitating towards w wanting more, being around better players. Well, I think when I when I got into a formalized type of, of basketball, for instance, and I realized that that when we were assigned to do things as a team, um, that more and more the coach would recognize me as someone to get out there and do it. And and one of the things through good coaching at that age was I was able to to build a little bit of self confidence. I really didn't know what that was, but but I knew that I was a little bit better than the other kids at that point. Mm -hmm. And that you just wanted more of that once you get that feeling you, of feeling good about yourself. You do, and you learn that, that, um, that being 
good and, and getting better is, is important. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite sport at that age? By far basketball. I was brought up with a basketball and, and really uh, um, early on basketball was really my true love. Mm -hmm. And just tell, tell the audience about your family. You're one of six kids. Uh -huh. if Uncle John was one of nine, right? Right. So what role did, did that play or did your parents play at the time? Well, as, as a youngster, we, we were thrown into the swimming pool early. I think my, my earliest recollection was I was six, seven years old and I was in competitive swimming. And as you know, growing up in upstate New York, jumping in a pool in the springtime outside can be a, a little bit of an eye-opening event. So we started competing without really know, knowing we were competing at a young age in the swimming pool. And the parents didn't push us. It was very much a, a, a family event. Um, and, you know, I swam competitively till, till I was about 10, and then I discovered uh, basketball. And how would you describe, I, I, I know for our family, the competitive nature, the, the sibling rivalries when your parents weren't there? Were you really tough with your brothers and we were constantly pushing each other? Well, in the pool, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, my, my two sisters were much better than I, I was. So I was, the rivalry was with my sisters. My older brother, as you know, ended up being the first in the family to get a full scholarship to Syracuse for swimming. So my rivalry really, I didn't have a big brother rivalry because of the separation in age, mm -hmm. uh, John being seven years older and me being five years older than Joey. But um, it certainly, uh, I, I learned early to compete and I learned that in the family unit. So talk about your father, uh, John Holohan Sr. And what was he like as a dad? And then if you could even take us back to you know, how he grew up and his time during World War II and the effect that had on your family and the way you were brought up. So my father was a, um, a I wouldn't say quiet, but he was a disciplinarian. He was the type of man who didn't have to say a lot in order to get you to do a lot. And um, he, uh, as I said, he, he, was, he was the one who pushed organized swimming, and he was, he was always the one taking us to practice, picking us up from practice. And in a, in a roundabout way, looking back, he, he understood what discipline meant, and, and he learned that in the Marines uh, in World War II. As you know, he was hit on Saipan. Um, he won the, the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart, and uh, never talked much about it, but. I think he understood that at some point in our lives, athletically or not, discipline becomes a foundation for the person that you would like to become. And if you don't have it, you're going to struggle. Well, I also think toughness you know, is, mm -hmm. is tucked in there in a big way because uh, Uncle John, his ship was sunk in the Atlantic off the coast of Africa. He right. was in the water. Right. And I'm sure some people died in that and didn't mm -hmm. make it back. And then he came home. He had 30 days to get himself together, then he was shipped to the Pacific, right. where he was shot in the head and left for dead, and he was doing it trying to save someone. So I would imagine that there wasn't much room for complaining around your house. No, no, and uh, that, 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 as you tell that story, I do remember that, and, and I, I, I remember him telling us that was one of the reasons we, we started swimming early, because he unfortunately had you know, friends who, who, who couldn't swim and weren't good swimmers and and uh, yeah he was a humble man and uh, he, he he was a tough guy a, a quiet tough guy he was just a, a super tough old-school man who, who who lived hard and expected his kids to you know, make the most of every day do you think that's accurate I would say that's very accurate and I think he he uh, the expectation that you didn't complain and uh, he, he had a saying when things go bad get up and go back to work and he lived his life that way. Mm -hmm. Now, in high school, I didn't learn this until later, but you were first team all New York State in both football and, and basketball. Correct. Correct. And one of the very few people, athletes, who did that. Did What was the recruiting process like when you started rising in both ranks? How did it work back then versus now? It was very chaotic. Um, I went up in the 77, um, I graduated, and right then, around there, you, you could only have X amount of visits. So I could only take six visits. So I had to decide be between basketball and football. 
and I started getting recruited heavily my sophomore year for basketball and then uh, football um, primarily my junior year so I had to had to decide which visits I was going to take and it was chaotic I mean looking back I was so overwhelmed uh, as well as the family was um, the phone would ring endlessly every every evening mm -hmm. and what schools were recruiting you on the basketball side and on the football side I have a vivid memory the first basketball school to recruit me was Tennessee I was uh, my sophomore year and uh, I got my first basketball letter that year and uh, um, I was I was predominantly recruited in basketball nationally so um, and then football uh, predominantly nationally so you know there were times when 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 I would get in a week 35 40 letters for both sports and so who are the coaches that came into your living room Oh boy, um, Woody Hayes, um, um, Joe Paterno. Um, geez, who's the head coach for Nebraska? Um, Tom Osborne, uh, basketball coaches uh, Jim Beheim. Um, the list goes on. I can't. I can't remember now. It's been so long. But um, Bo Schembechler, a lot of them. Um, and it was a, looking back, that was a treat for my parents as well. Well, I have two stories uh, to share with you that I learned over the years. Okay. One is, well, two, you can confirm whether this is true or not. Is it true that staff from one of those schools offered to give one of your sisters a swimming scholarship if you went to that school? That is correct. <laughs> You'll reveal the school. I will not. <laughs> okay. All right, and there's another one. Is it true that staff from one of those schools ran into you at the mall before the home visit while you were shopping for prom clothes and you were looking for a pair of shoes and the staff member bought you a much nicer pair of shoes than you could afford? That is correct. We won't reveal that We school. will not. <laughs> <laughs> but then when you came home and your father saw that you had a much nicer pair of shoes, what was his reaction? He made me return them. <laughs> okay, we just make sure that's true. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Uh, just, uh, only a whole handful yes. John thing. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> And when, when the, the third story I have is, I, you didn't know this, I don't think I've told you it, but one of my friends went up to Syracuse to interview Coach Beheim within the last three or four years. And I just mentioned to my friend Jomo, my cousin Pete was recruited by Beheim. And he's like, oh, that's cool. I'll ask Jimmy Beheim about your cousin. I said, oh, he'll, he'll never remember, right? Mm -hmm. And Jomo comes back and he says, Mo, um, uh, Jim Beheim remembered your cousin. I said, no, he didn't. He probably just was just saying yeah, that. Nice, yeah. Right? And he goes, no, he actually told the story of going, walking up the driveway to see your cousin and seeing the Franciscans from Notre Dame walking down the driveway and knowing he did not have a chance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he still remembered that. Yeah, well, yeah, that was a funny story. And uh, not only that, Beheim, you know, you talk about time passing. And he was walking the halls of Liverpool High School, the high school I was at. And he, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was recruiting way back then for Syracuse. And he also said when Joe Mo spoke to him that he felt you would have been an even better NBA player than NFL player. So when you went to Notre Dame and you played football, was there the temptation to go play basketball too? It really was. And, and I, I wasn't sure when I went to Notre Dame which I would have, was going to play. And in the summers, I would go to summer school and the basketball players would be there. And early on, um, you know, I, I competed very well against the starting basketball guys. So I probably could have played at Notre Dame, but, you know, the academics were such and football was demanding that. And it turned out okay. It did? Yeah. Um, let me just fix your mic. All right. There we go. So what were your early, early experiences at Notre Dame, given the rigors of the program? And were you just overwhelmed with with it and, and how so? Very overwhelmed. The first day I got there, quarterbacks had to report early. And um, so we're in the elevator and there's 13 of us. And I look around and I go, well, what position do you guys play? And of course they were all scholarship quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. And they were all the best quarterbacks from their states. And in hindsight, looking back, one of them was Joe Montana. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was two years older than I was. So overwhelming um, a little bit um, like what did I just get into and uh, it, it definitely was um, a huge huge wake-up call so t Joe Montana was two years older mm -hmm. and that mean meant that you had to change positions which is what you did 
and you played HVAC. So define to me like what an HVAC did. Is are there still HVACs? There are. There are. The the, the game has progressed um, um, where they use big guys as HVACs, tight ends, or, or, or running backs. But the HVAC is still there. Um, my freshman year, I played quarterback um, on the JVs. And then my freshman spring, they moved me to free safety. Um, and then um, I realized that uh, um, free safety it wasn't really my spot. So long story short, I was a third team flanker my sophomore year going into camp. And the starter got hurt early on. And then a week before the uh, Missouri game, the uh, starting flanker went down. And lo and behold, there I am, never playing wide receiver, starting against Missouri. Um, and my father, um, one of the great memories was my father and mother had never been to Notre Dame Stadium. So they drove out, and uh, I started and ended up catching five passes wow. for, for about 100 yards. So, wow. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, and then your your junior year, you were starting. I started my sophomore sophomore, sophomore year. Okay. Started three years. Okay, three years. Wow. Uh -huh. And I remember as a kid, you know how exciting that was. I think it was about eight or nine, and I was talking to my sister Megan. I go, "You're not going to remember this," but I remember being at your your mom and dad's house, where I think what was the Cotton Bowl, you were playing Georgia, and Great Uncle Joe was there, the Franciscan who worked at Georgia. And we're all in front of the TV, and we're so into this game. And Great Uncle Joe was always a little prankster. So your father's brother went downstairs and changed into a Georgia Bulldog shirt as soon as they took the lead. And your father was so mad at him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was he like, you cannot do that here. Yeah. So how intense were those games? From, from It was intense, and I was in the living room. I can't yeah. imagine being in that moment. Very intense. And... Uh, that year we played Georgia. They had Herschel Walker, and uh, it was it was they were really intense. And one of the great things about the University of Notre Dame was what you had talked about. You know, my family, our family, had the ability to get together. Uh, one year we took a they took a bus to to a game, seventy hola hands, and and as you and I know, that must have been quite a bus ride. But um, the intensity on the field was was wonderful. Great, great lessons to be learned. But you know, the game itself brought the family together, which is a good memory. Right. I, I, they w they didn't tell, take me on those trips because I was a little too young. But I right. know my mother and father went, and it was like the greatest thing when they came back, and it was just meant so much to our family. I think the Irish Catholic mm -hmm. piece and the pride it brought to our family, and it's uh, honestly really what inspired me to be an athlete. I just saw that what you did for our family. And even though I couldn't play football, I just sort of attached to knowing that that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And my dad would bring me to over 30 league games, and he said, what a good basketball player you were. And it, it's, I just marvel at like, how much those memories meet, meant to me, and then how much that was passed to Ryan and to Megan and to other, to Paul Seymour. Right. And it, it was just really an incredible thing as a kid. And I would tell my classmates at school, and they didn't believe me that you were my cousin. and. It, it was really exciting. I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the transition then to cop to pro ball. So you were drafted and you ended up with the Chargers. So wh what was that like, that transition time? I was the seventh round draft pick back back then, many moons ago. They had a two-day draft. And I was, unfortunately, there were six rounds the first day. And I wasn't picked and disappointed. So I was the third player drafted on the second day by the San Diego Chargers. Um, and uh, I came out here, and it was one of those really second-grade athletic awakenings for me because as good as I was in college, when I got here, I, I realized immediately that everybody was talented. And uh, it, it, took, it took a while for me to, to catch up with the speed of the game because I think you see so many college athletes who, who don't excel at the next level because the game is so much faster. Uh, and it took a while, but um, it, was, it, was a, uh, it was definitely a, a great experience. And you played behind Kellen Winslow. I did. And uh, Kellen, uh, wonderful man. Um, uh, he is an attorney now, and uh, I think he's the AD at, uh, I'm gonna, he's an AD at, at, at a Midwest school. Um, but. Kellen was um, 
prior to his injury, he was the most dominant tight end in the game. And if he didn't get hurt, uh, and I know you can relate, he blew out his ACL and uh, and and came back. But um, if he hadn't been hurt, he he probably would have gone down as the greatest tight end, in my humble opinion. Um, he's in the Hall of Fame, so that speaks volumes. I just remember as a kid, we would, we would be in the lobby, and I was maybe 10 or 11, 12, and even through college, I remember going through games, and I would see Charlie Joyner and Kellen and Dan Fouts, and Kellen always stood out to me. He was so nice to us, and he was warm, and I wanted to be so mad at him because he was taking your minutes, <laughs> right. and I would just right. go up there and met Kellen, yeah. and then he would be so nice to our family and sign things and just you know, yeah. pat me on the head. He was, he was wonderful, and I, I remember when I blew up my knee, um, I was on crutches, and I was 16 years old or 17, and we went to a Giants game. And your dad invited three football players, big, just the three offensive linemen to come in, including the chief. Yeah, Sam. Fla Sam. Yeah. And then this other guy, Frank from Notre Dame. And I'm like, in, I'm in the yeah. bed and my knees up and I'm depressed. And all of a sudden I got like three offensive linemen yeah. sitting on my bed. And I'm, I can't even talk to a boy 16 years old, let alone <laughs> handle this. And uh, your dad comes in and they're all trying to give me advice on how to overcome this injury. And I just, I, was, I just didn't talk. I just looked at them. Yeah. But all those guys and uh, were just so memorable. Do you have any favorite teammates? Um, yeah, Chief was a, 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 a good teammate and, and a favorite. He was, you know, the biggest Indian you'll ever see and, and uh, just a nice guy. Um, a linebacker up in L.A., Larry Kalm, uh, a good guy. And, and really a lot of good relationships. And, and um, yeah, I, I don't. You know, really have any real specific, but a lot of great, great friendships. Do you have? Can you describe the difference between what it felt like to play college ball versus pro ball? And mm -hmm. was there a difference in pressure when you're out there? I mean, how many thousands of people did it take to amp up the pressure? Yeah, I, I don't. I, I think at every level, you, you, uh, you know, as as being a, a great athlete, that you know the pressure starts within. So it's how you handle it. The pressure was great at Notre Dame. I was younger, but um, you know, I don't. The, the pressure wasn't really different because um, there was large pressure at both venues. Um, I think I, as I got older and more mature in in the NFL, I looked at pressure differently and was able to handle it different. Uh, but pressure is pressure, and, and at the professional level, um, you, you don't feel it as much as most people might think. Well, I. I Earlier I said that like, I can't imagine that when I actually can because when I would play, I remember one of the most intense high school games I was in was at Nottingham High School. Yeah. And our team road tripped out two and a half hours and Uncle Pete and Anna Lane stopped by and they were the only two fans. And it was at this pivotal moment of our high school team turning the corner on what was going to be great things to come. And I remember how intense that game was and it was just two people there. So after yeah. a while, we would be at Ohio State and there would be 15,000 people cheering against you. Or you'd be in a summer league game and you would still get so into the moment that it's almost as though the walls went up around the court and it was just you. Mm -hmm. Did you feel the same way? Like I know you competed in the summers, you played basketball, and were you just a competitor as a competitor? Yeah, I think it's, you know, to a degree, I, 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 I don't believe you can necessarily teach people to compete. It's a lot like work ethic. Um, you don't, so I think, you know, we, we've been, we were fortunate it's in our DNA and then we took it to the next level, but, um, yeah, you can either compete or you, you either want to compete or you don't, you either can compete or you can't. Mm -hmm. And some people disagree with that, but I, I do believe that to be true. What do you think in terms of like mental toughness or training? Do you think you excelled in that area or did you see other people excel? Cause at a certain point you guys are all so exceptional mm -hmm. physically. Right. I think that's one of the big, big ingredients that whether you make it or you don't at the professional level, even at the collegiate level, because you know Division One sports, Division Two sports, a lot of good athletes. Um, so the mental toughness really becomes the the turning point, the difference on those who make it to the next level, or who make it at the collegiate level. So um, yeah, you got to be mentally tough. How many of those guys that you talked about made it 12 years in the NFL? I mean, that's a that's a. How many did Kellen play? Kellen played eight, and you know his oh. knee was was one of the reasons. Uh, you know, and 
as you know, once again, because you hurt your knee, it's it's. Um, I'm the first to admit you got to be a little bit lucky in in sports and in, in the NFL. Of course, you're going to get hurt. You just got to avoid that career ender. Um, so I was fortunate. Got hurt a bunch, but didn't get anything that really really knocked me down for a real long period of time. So um, 12 years was a long time, and one of the things that um, that I know helped me play that long was my season didn't really end the last game of the year. It, I took a month off, but then I worked as hard or harder in the off season. Mm -hmm. I remember one summer because we would see you for the can't do family reunions, yep. and we would. I remember your weight would be different each year, yeah. and as you got into your professional career, I would always just sort of eavesdrop in whatever your plan was because sometimes you like would beef up before right. the camp. Mm -hmm. So, and then one summer you were doing some type of Russian plyometric jumping routine that you swore by. Going back then, what what training methods did you use that felt, like, made you feel like you got the most of that off season? Every year they, as you know, every year, you know, there would be new innovations, they tweak things, but the big, the epiphany for me early in my career was was the plyometrics, the squats, the cleans, those power lifts that generated power. And I, I really realized some um, increased speed. So, um, and the older I got and, and I did a lot more interval training and, but really for me, the, the, the epiphany was that power training that gave me that speed mm -hmm. really worked well. I, I was, I ran into one of your teammates. I think his name was Flipper. Flipper Anderson? Yeah. Yeah. I ran into him in Chicago or somewhere, and I and I also um, I ran into him a few other players later, but I went up to Flipper and said I was your cousin, and he said, you mean sticky fingers? And I said, you know, I was sort of surprised. He's like, I'd never seen hands like Pete's hand. What do, you, what do you attribute your hands to? I mean, your dad had really big hands. So did you work on your hands? Did you, what did you do to develop? I remember one catch you had, it's kind of funny, you were running in this direction, and I would, when I would watch you, I'd always just be so happy that you one, you were in, and two, you're catching the ball. But then I would, I can't imagine because your wife's here with us. Didn't you like hold your breath every time you caught it? You're like so happy. You're like, please get up. <laughs> right? yeah, no yeah. one hit him too hard. Right. So you were going. It was right by the end zone. You were running to your left, but the ball came over your right shoulder. So you had to turn in the opposite direction, and in doing so, you couldn't get your right hand. So you grabbed it on top of the ball with your left hand and you caught it with one hand on top of the ball. I don't know who, you, do you remember who you're playing? Be uh, maybe New York Giants? Yeah, and then you roll, you caught it with one hand and rolled to show the official that you caught it, but you forgot to get in the end zone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, typical, right, <laughs> so yeah. You were like so excited that you caught it and yeah. then you're on the one. Yeah, yeah, field goal, <laughs> right, yeah. So did you, did you work in the off season on your hands? Um, not really, but I, I, I believe this when I talk to the youngsters, you know, basketball was a key um, um, catalyst for the eye-hand coordination, particularly the, the rebounding and, you know, the best rebounders aren't, aren't always the best jumpers. Now, sometimes they are, of course, but, you know, it's that ability to time it, you know, and, and you know, jump shooting and a lot of that is the, the, the eye-hand. So I think that was a catalyst early on. And um, and I, I I did religiously during the season. I always went out to practice 20 minutes early. Caught a couple hundred passes before. So there was a little bit of, of the the I think the natural eye hand, a lot of work, and of course muscle memory with the practice. Right. I, I also ran into John Robinson and in, in, an elevator. I was at the Rose Bowl, and I I went to watch Northwestern. And it just so happened that, I, that he was coaching USC at the time. And he, sure enough, he gets on the elevator with me. And I was with my college roommates. And he was standing right next to me. So I said, hi, I'm Maureen. And my cousin's Pete. And he was like, he's one of the nicest guys, one of the best players, hardest workers. And, and he meant it. Like, he stopped. Him. We got out of the elevator. He kept talking. And I thought that was such a high compliment. Did you have a good relationship with John? I did. And he... Uh he actually uh, was a, a real important guy in, in, in my career and, and uh, um, wrote a real nice letter um, when I retired. And 
we had a gathering with the family and and uh, so yeah he was a he was a real 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 important person in, in my career so what would you say your your best your personal or team highlights were at Notre Dame or professionally like, what were some of the great moments you know at Notre Dame we um, played in four bowl games won the national championship uh, my freshman year I, d I didn't play that year my sophomore year we, we played uh, Houston in the Cotton Bowl and came back and won my junior year uh, we won the Cotton Bowl and my senior year we got beat by Georgia in the in the Sugar Bowl so I think I cumulatively at Notre Dame it was that every year being in the hunt for the national championship and then um, in, in the in the NFL um, when I was traded up to the, to the LA Rams once again um, for three straight years we were in the playoff hunt so my memories really are more team oriented because I think and you know this in a team sport um, when collectively you can get it done mm -hmm. and you're part of that there's no better feeling right I, yeah I agree and yeah. one of my favorite experiences is just my high school team I just really there's something about that team and winning a state title and never having done that before in our area and the people who are on that team and being a contributor even though we did well at Northwestern I just felt a connection with those teammates now we'll talk about the last few things before we close is people are gonna ha ask you about the concussions I'm sure they ask you all the time at yeah. work and I also like if you talk about concussions also talk about the rest of your body and like where you are at this point in your life and what things you do to to respect the fact that you, you have endured physically a lot and to keep yourself as in best shape as possible. Well, the first thing I'd like to say about the concussions and, you know, the, the hometown paper, the Syracuse Herald Journal, um, interviewed me about it and I've talked a lot about it because it's been in the news a lot. Mm -hmm. The first thing is no one forced me to play. So I knew there was an inherent risk to play. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me today, would you, would you do it again? I would unequivocally say yes, because I, I never played for the pay, didn't play for the money, played for the love of the game. So would I do it? Yes. That being said, are there a lot of guys who are in trouble and need help? Absolutely. I think it's incumbent upon the NFL to take care of those guys who have the issues. And um, I, I believe that the NFL is doing more and more, but I, I you know, it, you know going in that it's a collision sport and uh, I would do it all again and, and I know some people will find that answer a little bit off kilter but that's how I feel. Now how many do you think you had because they, they're, they're diagnosing more and more now and you probably are playing with a few and I also remember my dad said that you got a bad one with a beer bottle is that true did you get hit with a beer bottle from a fan I think it was a bottle of Jack Daniels but <laughs> okay that makes sense. yeah bigger. yeah yeah and it, yeah in Philadelphia so yeah. that gave that was a yeah that was one. yeah that one was uh, yeah didn't see it coming mm -hmm. but I I, I probably you know I really I haven't kept count but I, I mean I can tell you ten times uh, where I had a concussion, where I knew it. And the number's probably much higher, mm -hmm. much higher. But, you know, one of the symptoms I still have today is that my vision will, out of the blue, will just go kind of haywire and it'll kind of look like everything's an escalator, get real blurry, and, mm -hmm. and that's kind of that's kind of scary. So, you know, and I can only imagine what, what um, some of these other guys are going through who, who have had more trauma but um, yeah it's it's definitely um, something that you think about and now what do you what are the residual effects like you said you're you have the double hip you have the neck mm -hmm. issue that bothers you but you yeah. get up at 3 30 in the morning and you do your meditation right you go to the gym you know have you always done that or like let, let's just talk about like did you just get in a lot of pain again and try to get dig yourself out of it when I retired I mean I had been playing sports for a long time four years at Notre Dame 12 years in the NFL high school so it uh, you know I, I kind of got away from working out initially and and um, I realized that that's who I am and and part of part of the reason I get up in the morning and train is is because 
I'm a healthier person. I'm a happier person. And you and I were just talking about it, the meditation piece. Um, I've, I've really never thought I would be that type to meditate, but it, it's helped me um, to find that inner peace and combine with the athletics and, and the training. It's been a good good cocktail for me. Right. So it keeps your your weight down or regulated enough for you to be out of regulated. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, but it keeps it keeps the if you add on more weight, it's going to increase the inflammation and right. carry it around, and it keeps your pain level. I mean, are, are you do you have pain every day or? You know, my not really. My uh, I cracked my fifth and sixth vertebrae, and when I played, and that comes back, you know, at different times. My hips have been a blessing, the two titanium hips. Without those, I, I'd probably be in a wheelchair right now, mm -hmm. quite frankly. So I, not a lot of pain, and, and the exercise is, is as much um, therapeutic as it is uh, proactive. Now, just getting back to the, the tail end of your career, because mm -hmm. I think we both had the same injury, the plantar fasciitis. Yeah. Do you think that triggered the collapse? Because that's what it felt like for me, is it just everything fell down, or was it... You were 12 years in and that, or how do you think that did that ripple effect up to your hips? Well, I think it goes back a little bit to the point we were talking about earlier, you know, the mental toughness piece. You know, when you blow your knee out, you know you're hurt. With the plantar fascia, you know, it's, it's you know, it hurts, really hurts, and, and but you try to play through it. You run differently, you stand differently. So, but in your mind, it's only your arch. So you continue to work through it, and then to your to your question, it, it, you get to the point where you're running different, you're standing, di and then it compounds. And my hips probably were going to go, mm -hmm. but it ex I'm sure it accelerated it because of the way I was running and moving. So it definitely was a precursor for sure. How many injections do you think you had on your feet just to get through that final NFL season? I saw you. Um, Hundreds. Oh God. <laughs> and you know the bottom of the foot, it's kind of tender. Hurts. Oh, <laughs> this hurts thinking about it. Now. Yeah. I, I think were they were you getting injections like during the game to get the pain down? Uh huh. And that was, um, that probably was. But I took an injection, and I played, but I couldn't play after that. I couldn't. You know, I had to stop because it, there was so much damage to it. I started losing feeling in my feet. Yeah. I had nerve damage. I, I saw you, my mom and I road tripped, I think on the way to or from Northwestern. We caught a Browns game. They let us in. We talked, we sweet talked our way in. Yeah. We had great seats. We <laughs> caught up with you after the game. And I remember you were walking to the car and I was like, Pete, what's, what's the matter? And like, oh, I got this foot issue. But I had the same injury. And what you said is, it looks like you're okay. Yeah but you're in crippling pain all the time and it everything else goes above that. So when you retired, I, I want to talk about one last quote that was in USA Today, I think, that's where I read it. When you retired, I think you released a statement that said, sometimes when you push put your foot on the gas, the car just won't go. Right. <laughs> I, I replay that because I've tried to come out of retirement several times and I... Yeah. So it, that's how you felt, right? Yep, and I, I just couldn't get in and out of breaks and the harder I pushed the slower I went but yeah, um, yeah so it, absolutely that's that's how I felt and how how hard was it to stop competing I mean did you how, uh, how long looking back I was probably it took me three years to to really enjoy looking back maybe even longer because you know I it, it was difficult and it wasn't difficult because the, the cheers stopped. I, that I suddenly stopped competing at a level that most don't. And it was a very, very difficult transition. So you were used to having a reason to get out of bed, right? To mm -hmm. go at the highest level and all of a sudden that's taken away from you. So the, the level of the letdown and not having that or trying to go pick it up at the Y and play basketball. There's just, those folks just don't get it. And remember, like you, I was playing because I loved the game, had passion for the game. So when that disappears, you go, hmm, what's going to fill this void? Now, did you go right into, you were working for Cisco, or how, how long did it take for you to figure out that 
next step for yourself? A couple, three years. and uh, No working, just... Yeah, I, not much working at all, just kind of trying to figure it out. You know, thinking about coming back, trying to have a comeback like we all do. And uh, maybe it was a couple years. Um, and uh, How old were your kids at the time? Yeah. When this guy went from Sarah was four. Yeah. The young, girls were young. Right. Four and one, five and two. And you came back to San Diego or did you stay? No, we came back to San Diego. Okay. Yep. And you know why. Because <laughs> the weather. I know. You've got, I, I haven't had any pain in yeah. 36 hours. <laughs> right. So right. I see why yeah. you stayed here. Yeah. Uh, so you then got the job at, at Cisco. Uh -huh. And how did you like putting the suit on and going into the corporate world? It, it was a, it was definitely another transition, but um, you know I, I was able to learn to apply those lessons you learn as an athlete. Once again, the discipline. Um, you embrace the competition, and um, really, I, I used to have a, a little little ongoing joke with myself that you know pressure's dropping the rock in front of a hundred thousand. Screwing up at Cisco, man, eh, not so bad, you know. <laughs> I, I had the same. I, I think when you have a college coach or a coach yelling at you and humiliating you in front of a thousand to fifteen thousand to fifty thousand yeah. people, your next boss is going to feel like. Yeah, yeah, really. All right, I got it. What else you got, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I feel the same way, and I think a lot, a lot of people um, obviously don't react that way. No. And two, the boss that's used to getting under people's skin who can't get under your skin yeah. can't figure you out. You end up being his or her boss. Correct. Right. <laughs> right. In right. a matter of time. So is that what happened? You came in at a, a lower level? Entry level, yeah. So what was the title at the time and where are you now? I came in as a sales associate, um, worked my way up through management, and now I'm the director of sales. So I basically run the sales force. At Cisco, and you're in yeah. charge of how many people? About 100. Okay. Yep. And do you like that? You're definitely a people person. I do. And, you know, and once again, I, I can relay it back to, you know, setting goals, achieving goals, um, um, leading people, uh, understanding that leadership's about the group and not the individual, all those things that we've learned throughout our, mm -hmm. our lives as athletes. Um, so, and I enjoy it. I enjoy the, the leadership aspect of it mm -hmm. and, and driving the result. And it's been a lot of fun. Okay, so then that's great. I, the, the way I want to end every show is to talk about three things or one to three things, if you want to narrow it down, that you did really well as an athlete or person or a combination of both. And then three things that if you look back, like you wish you would have changed or you can shed some advice to someone listening, whether at the high school, college, or pro level. So what are the three things that you think were the three biggest reasons for your success? Well, the, the first thing was that... Um, the passion piece. I had passion for what I did, mm -hmm. and and I don't want to overplay the card. But when you, when you enjoy what you're doing, your chances of, of success. So I was passionate about being an athlete, mm -hmm. being a football player, and I think with that passion um, came the understanding that you had to develop a work ethic. I think I had a strong work ethic, and and then third, you know, one of the reasons that. One of the things I did well was that I was able to keep um, keep in balance my wonderful family mm -hmm. and my career. I knew that uh, the it was a great career, but you know it was it was just a career. I remember one of the most striking things about you at all these family events, and I think you were aware of how much we all looked up to you and. And that's a lot of weight to carry, to be everyone's friend in the family. But at all the family events, you were always so happy and loving and, like, fun. And there's Pete. And you really kind of carried the torch well. And Thank then you. The, the, the coolest thing to me is you were that, that great guy at the parties. And we didn't see you a lot, but when we saw you, we, we got all of you. And number two, when you played, what was remarkable to me, and it kind of gave me the freedom to do the same thing, is you changed. You became an animal out there right. without any regrets and never in a dirty way. Right. And I liked that. I liked that you could be this emotional person with the family and then change your emotions entirely. And people still respect you for it. I think a lot of people 
at least the kids I coach, think that if you're an animal on the court, you must be an animal off no. the court. No, you're right. That's you have to be able to to, to do that. And as you know, as a competitive high level athlete, you have to be able to to um, turn it on and 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 play with those instincts. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the things you would have improved, I, I don't want to end on a negative. But what sure. I what I like to do is say. What do we, you know, what do we know now, whether it be nutrition or training or all the things we've been talking about tonight, that either you had, if you had access to more information or you had a coach that, that would have played a role in making your career better, however your career was, was pretty awesome in itself, I, I think. So what, what th few things would you throw out there that you look back and think, you know, what if? I would have trained smarter. Um, the first thing I would have done because I overtrained for those 12 years which wasn't a bad thing, but you know, I, I we were talking about the plantar fasciitis, and and I would play basketball all off season, and you know, I think if if I had trained smarter and and protected my body more, I think I, I probably would have even played longer. Um, you know, secondly, I think that um, if I had to do it all over again, I, I would have uh, enjoyed to ride a little bit more. I would have, you know, you talk about the precious present, and and uh, I, I would have would have enjoyed um, maybe some of the little things that, looking back, you, I took for granted. And, and finally, if I had to do it all over again, I would have played hoops. <laughs> That's what I would hear on Momo Radio. It's all about hoops. Yes, I know. It's, uh, well, the two out of the three are mine too. The passion piece and having more, enjoying it yeah. more. I think when you have the work ethic and you're so emotional about what you do, the whole perfection card keeps coming up and you're just never happy. You're staying yeah. up at night thinking all you didn't do instead of celebrating all that you did do. Mm -hmm. And whether you're on the basketball court or football field, I, I think, uh, or whether you're boxing or playing the piano, I think people can get really lost and yeah. and not be able to change that until it's a little bit too late. Right. But it's always fun to see you. You too, you look wonderful. Thank you. You uh, haven't aged a bit. <laughs> Thanks. So I'd love to see you. And next time I come out, we'll, we'll do this again or we'll, we'll do something fun and maybe catch the girls. So thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap of the first Mo Grit podcast. On deck, we have an interview with my most successful friend on the basketball court, Anita kaplan Fidel. Anita was a star center at Stanford University where she was a national champion and All-American. If you're interested in more information about how to coach kids, how to run clinics, private coaching, and more, you can visit momotion.com. It's there where you'll find a lot of information about people who inspire me. Get out there, train smart, be excellent, and get a little gritty. <laughs>